Also, a reminder yet that uh, the fellowship groups are starting up again or are going. Uh, next week, next Sunday afternoon, uh, Frakes is starting up. Uh, Willem is on Tuesdays. And uh, uh, just check it out and that, uh, um, also check out uh, the weekly bulletin. Um, it's time for scripture reading. Today's scripture reading is from Nehemiah 8, verse 9 to 18. Uh, can I ask Kendra to come forward? Good morning. This uh, morning's scripture reading is Nehemiah 8 and verse 9 to 18. It says, Then Nehemiah the governor, Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who were instructing the people said to them all, This day is sacred to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people had been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. Nehemiah said, Go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks, and send some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is sacred to our Lord. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The Levites calmed all the people, saying, Be still, for this is a sacred day. Do not grieve. Then all the people went away to eat and drink, to send portions of food, and to celebrate with great joy, because they now understand they now understood the words that have been made known to them. On the second day of the month, the heads of all the families, along with all the priests and the Levites, gathered around Ezra, the scribe, to give attention to the words of the law. They found written in the law, which the Lord had commanded through Moses, that the Ezraites were to live in, in booths during the feast of the seventh month, and that they should proclaim this word and spread it throughout their towns in Jerusalem. Go out into the hill country and bring back, out into the hill country and bring back branches from olive and wild olive trees, and from myrtles, palms, and shade trees to make booths, as it is written. So the people went out and brought back branches and built themselves booths on their own roofs in their courtyards, in the courts of the house of God, and in the square by the water gate and by the one of the gate of Ephraim. The whole company that had returned from exile built booths and lived in them from the days of Joshua, son of Nun, until that until that of that day the israelites had not celebrated it like this and the joy was very great day after day from the first day to the last ezra read from the book of the law of god they celebrated the feast for seven days and on the eighth day in accordance with the regulation there was an assembly thanks kinder that's right looking forward to, to hear what god put on your heart well, good morning, IBC. That is, yes, technology is great when it works, isn't it? I was a sound man for many years, so I appreciate what those gentlemen are doing. Now, if you're one of those that likes to take notes, I've got a couple uh, handouts for a few people. If you'd like to take notes, it's not a have to, not an obligation. But if that's something you'd like to do, just go ahead and raise your hand and one of my boys will put one in your hand. But we're looking at co-work and celebration, how the Lord's joy is our strength. And thank you, Kendra, for reading that. And there are several aspects that I want to look at today in this passage that the Lord has brought to us. One of the first things we want to consider is, is that there is a time for mourning for our sins. Now, in the, the writer of Ecclesiastes says in chapter 3 that there's a time for every activity under heaven, Ecclesiastes 3. There's a time for mourning. There's a time for dancing. And in my professional life, we are instructed from the most basic of our training to arrive 15 minutes early to any meeting. The saying goes in my professional life, if you're early, you're on time. If you're on time, you're late. And if you're late, you're in trouble. So it's not that legalistic as we see that today, but the scriptures would tell us that there is a time for mourning for sin. We read that the people were overcome by their grief to the point that the Levites, in verse 11, had to quiet them down. 
And we'll see in next, month, next week's scripture that there was a national confession of sin. And this passage can confuse some people by saying that there isn't a time for mourning for sin. But yet there is. That's why we have to take all of scripture as a whole, looking at it from Genesis to Revelation. For those of you that take notes, we remind ourselves that Jesus commanded us to pray and ask for forgiveness. In the Lord's Prayer, we read where Jesus taught us how to pray, that we are to pray and ask for forgiveness. Matthew 6, 12. Is prayer a part of your life? Is a part of that prayer, an aspect of it, asking for forgiveness? One of the most famous passages on asking for forgiveness is in Psalm 51, where David wrote this psalm after his sins with Bathsheba and Uriah, where David focuses on restoration, not how holy he is, not how special he is, but how much he messed up, and ascribing worth to God, saying, you are the Holy One. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 7, verse 10, 2 Corinthians 7, verse 10, that godly sorrow leads to repentance. This sorrow should motivate us to change, to transform, to repent of our sinful ways. And one of my favorite verses of talking about forgiveness is 1 John 1, 9. We, Christians, have the guarantee of forgiveness. No other religion has that. For we know, according to 1 John 1, 9, that if we are faithful and just to confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, 9. So it is very important in the life of the believer to confess sins daily, sometimes even hourly. It was important for the Israelites to do. We will see that next week. For we need to restore that fellowship that we have in Christ. So yes, there is a time for mourning for our sin. Then in the next few verses, 10 through 12, we see that there is a time for celebration. Now, we have many different cultures represented here in person today and online. And I want each of you to think about what is the dish, what is the food that you have back home when it's time to celebrate? What is it? Maybe, I mean, I know birthday cakes are universal, but I'm thinking, what is the special meal that you look forward to? Um, my job required me to travel back to the States for a few weeks for training. And back home, there are a couple restaurants that we patronize religiously, excuse the term, because of their Christian stance. And one of those is Chick-fil-A. Now, if you ever get to go to the States... On traveling, you need to find a Chick-fil-A because the owners believe just like we do. There's actually a joke in America about how it's God's holy chicken. Now, I find it interesting that in my travels, chicken is served in a lot of different countries, a lot of different cultures. Makes me wonder if God has a plan for that. I'll just let you go down that rabbit trail another day. But we do know that food has been a part of celebration forever. And we know that one day we get to share in in what? The wedding feast of the Lamb, according to Revelation. So here they are told to eat and drink what is rich, drink what is sweet. They're told to celebrate with food. This celebration included all. Send portions to those who have nothing prepared since today is holy. Today is special. Celebrations are better when they are shared. You see, also generosity is a way of healing. 
By giving to others, we take the focus off of ourselves and on to the less fortunate. It really helps with perspective. <clears throat> the focus was joy for this festival, not grief. The Levites said that this day was holy. It was set apart for God. That word holy is a very interesting Hebrew term that we don't have time to, de to dedicate to today. But what it means is, is that it is set apart for special dedicated use. That this day is set apart for special dedicated use. I would think that all of us in our homes have something that we keep for special occasions. We could say that that item is holy because we don't use it or treat it like we do every day. It is utilized for a special and a dedicated use. The Levites, the worship leaders, were instructing the people, this day is special and it needs to be treated as such. So after it was explained to them by the Levites, in verse 11 we see in verse 12, then all the people began to eat and drink. There's food again to send portions and to have a great celebration. Why? Because they understood the words that were explained to them. The psalmist writes in Psalm 103, verse 1, that God does not treat us as our sins deserved. So these people went from utter despair and crying to realizing that this was a special day, that God had not treated them as they deserved, so they went and partied. The time was to celebrate. Morning would come, but the time was to focus on joy. Now there's a famous verse as we transition to the joy of the Lord is your strength. Now arguably this is probably one of the most famous verses in this book, arguably, that, that people quote that people memorize. So I would ask you today, what motivates you to continue when life is tough? It is very difficult to pick up your family and relocate to a different country, a different culture. It is very difficult to learn a completely different language and a way of doing business. How do we continue to motivate ourselves when life is tough? Well, the joy of the Lord is our strength. So first, we're going to look at and define what joy is. And we're going to define joy by looking in Scripture. Well, we see throughout Scripture that joy is a matter of perspective, the way you look at things. Paul commanded us in Philippians 4, verse 4, to rejoice in the Lord always, Again, I say rejoice. He says everybody needs to see this about you in verse 5. And then he commands them, instead of worrying, pray. It's amazing that in that chapter, prior to those verses, you have two people that refuse to get along. And after, those, after the ver command to rejoice, you have people worrying. And I don't know about you, but I imagine that the majority of us, at least once in our life, have had trouble getting along with somebody else. And at least once in your life, you've had some worry. And Paul says in the middle of that, to never stop being joyful. Even when we're not getting along with each other, even when we have things to worry. Paul also instructed the church in Galatia that joy was a fruit of the Spirit. The things that a Christian should display or produce. That's why they're called fruits. The first in Galatians chapter 5 verse 22, Galatians chapter 5 verse 22 is love, but then it's followed by joy. So joy is not based on what happens to us, but resting in what God has done for us. Joy is not based on what happens to us, but resting in what God has done for us. Focusing not on circumstances, but that He is in control. 
As I was studying for this, I was studying some uh, writings by R.C. Sproul. R.C. Sproul, he's a famous theologian, and I'm just going to quote him verbatim. I'm going to literally read his quote because he's a whole lot smarter than I am and explains it a whole lot better than I ever could. But I do want to give credit to R.C. Sproul for this. He says that a person can have biblical joy even when they are mourning, suffering, or undergoing difficult circumstances. This is because the person's mourning is directed, the person's mourning is directed at one concern. But in that very same moment, they possess a measure of joy. The key, he continues, <clears throat> the key to the Christian's joy is its source which is the Lord. If Christ is in me and I am in him, that relationship is not a sometimes experience. The Christian is always in the Lord, and the Lord is always in the Christian, and that is a reason for joy. Even if the Christian cannot rejoice in the circumstances, if he finds himself passing through pain, sorrow, or grief, they can still rejoice in Christ. We rejoice in the Lord, and since he never leaves or forsakes us, we can rejoice always. R.C. Sproul. So joy is a choice. Joy is a command. Joy is focusing on what God has done, not focusing on what our circumstances are. Let's continue by seeing what joy does. The joy of the Lord is your strength. And as I was studying this, I remembered that ancient hymn that Martin Luther wrote, the father of the Protestant Reformation. If you've never studied Martin Luther, he's definitely worth your time. Arguably, you would not be sitting here today if it wasn't for Martin Luther and if it wasn't for his wife who continually encouraged him, even in his darkest days. Martin Luther wrote, In a mighty fortress is our God, that... The Lord is a bulwark, never failing. That word bulwark in some translations of Nehemiah 8.10 says that the joy of the Lord is a bulwark, a fortress. You see, that word bulwark or strength can mean a defensive wall. Martin Luther closes out the song, a mighty fortress is in our God, by singing, This mortal life they may kill, but God's truth abideth still. His kingdom is forever. Now, we are so far removed from ancient Near East history. So may I recall, bring you to mind, just how important a wall was to both the people that lived in the city and those that lived around it. In springtime, it was customary for raiding parties to come from foreign countries, and they would rob, pillage, and do very mean things to the women at this time of year, March, April, May. The only hope you had was, because you are one family, was to run to the village, run to the wall, and pray you made it before the pillagers got you. But once you made it through that gate, the king's soldiers stood ready to protect you. You just had to outrun the party. Can you imagine being carried on your day and seeing in the distance a raiding party, grabbing your children and running to the wall? I can't even fathom that. I mean, it reminds me of what's going on in Ukraine. I mean, I see pictures of priests in bomb shelters still offering services. 
So these people living in Nehemiah's day knew that a wall was the difference in life and death. And if they could make it to that wall, it would protect them, and then the king's soldiers would unleash on the raiders. Protection was a gigantic deal in these days, in the days of Nehemiah. And God, even though they sinned, was still offering protection. This would have resonated with these people, would have sent them to their knees thinking, well, I don't deserve this love. I don't deserve this protection, but God still does it if I run to Him. Dr. James Hamilton calls the joy of the Lord God's good pleasure and will. It was God's good pleasure and will to move in Cyrus to command the wall to be built. It was God's good pleasure to move in Cyrus to allow Nehemiah to go. It is this joy that His will will happen one day. It makes me think of Romans chapter 5, verse 8. Romans chapter 5, verse 8 where Paul declares that God demonstrates, proves His love for us in this, that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. That means there is no sin that you can commit that can get you outside the love of God. Because Christ died for you, knowing every lie, everything you would do wrong. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 10. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 10 says that whether we're awake or asleep, the biblical language for life and death, Jesus Christ died so that we may have fellowship with Him. He literally died to hang out with you. This joy is our strength, for we rest in knowing that He died to make it possible. He died to be our protection. He died so that we could have fellowship with Him, both now here on this planet and where we depart one day. This joy is our strength to continue on. All of us feel, feel discouragement, difficulty, and regret, as the people did. And the Levites explained to them that the joy of the Lord is your fortress. And this energized them to the point they had a great celebration. The joy of the Lord is our strength to continue and even celebrate. So now let's look at the last part of this chapter, the festival of shelters in verses 13 through 18. Now, the festivals, not only this one, booths, tabernacles, depending on your translation, but the festivals as a whole served as reminders of what God had done and will continue to do. The festivals served as reminders of what God had done and will continue to do. I want you to remember, those of you that are parents, when your children took their first steps. Is that something that's burned into the mind's eye? Those of you that don't have uh, children, what is the last funny video you watched? Does that make you smile at all when you recall a good memory? Well, of course it does. Of course it does. That's why we take pictures to remind us of good things. Why we get souvenirs when we visit somewhere new. And these festivals served as reminders for the Jewish people to remind them of what God had done in the past and will continue to do. The festival of booths, the festival of shelters, the festival of tabernacles, it goes by all those different, different um, words or translations in our Bibles, was to have the Jews remember the 40 years they spent in tents waiting to go to the promised land. Those of you that have studied Scripture, remember that because of their sins, God said, y'all ain't going to get my promised land. You're going to have to wait until this generation passes away. So 40 years they stayed in a tent, moving around until they were allowed to enter the promised land. 
Now, I thought this was funny. I was reading Dr. Derek Thomas. He said this would have been a very fun occasion for children especially because you're camping. And many of us do enjoy camping, and then some of us think that camping involves a hotel or a, mo or a, a lodging away from home. But the idea was is that we are going to camp in tents to remind us of what our forefathers went through. And this would have been great until it started to rain. And then it became a, quote to quote Dr. Thomas, a special reminder of hardship and inconvenience. You see, this, this festival served as a reminder of God's protection. Now remember, walls are a big deal in, the, in Nehemiah and his fellow Jews' ideal. And a tent is the opposite of security. Think about it. How easy is it is to rip a tent if you have a flint blade? It's almost indefensible. So this would have reminded the average Jew, even the Jew living in the city, those that lived in the cities would camp on their roofs. Those that didn't have roofs or lived in smaller places would literally take over vacant lots. It was to remind them of God's protection even when you couldn't be protected by yourself. For a tent was extremely indefensible. It also reminded them of God's provision. This year in 2020, the Sukkot, or the Festival of Booths, the Festival of Tabernacles, Festival of Shelters, depending on your translation, will start on October the 9th. It was a harvest festival, y'all. It literally was. That's why the kids look forward to it, is because you could... No longer through winter you were living on what you had kept all of these months. You were enjoying the bountiful things that God provided. And this reminded them that God provided manna in the desert just as God provides the harvest. It was actually commanded to be a joyful festival. I found this interesting. Deuteronomy 16.14 it is commanded to be a joyful festival. So how on earth am I supposed to be joyful when I'm not sleeping in my bed, when I'm sleeping in a tent, it's cold, it's rainy, and I'm commanded to be joyful? Because joy is a choice. Joy is a command to focus on God and not our circumstances. So what is significant about this specific observance? If you notice that on verse 13, on the second day, the heads of the household came back. We knew from last week that the entire congregation showed up and listened from dawn till dusk. Well, the dads came back, the family heads came back a second day for even more study. And then they came and explained to their household in such a way Verse 17, that the entire community made shelters. <clears throat> so the heads of the household came back for additional study on day two. And they did such an excellent job of going home to their families that their families were motivated to live in these tents and be joyful. How well do we explain what God has told us to our families. Few times in Scripture do we see that the entire community was united to celebrate the work that God had accomplished through them. One entire day they stayed for many hours listening as the Scriptures were explained to them. Day two, the heads of the household came it had it explained to them again. They go home, explain it to their families, because all mamas know who ended up having to get the kids together for this uh, camping trip. The moms. Any women out there agree with me, or am I completely off base? It was the mamas that got it done. Because the daddies were in church, came home and explained it, and the entire community came together. So in co-working and celebration, we remember there is a time to mourn, to make sure we ask forgiveness for our sins, and there is a time to celebrate. We understand that the joy of the Lord is our strength, 
our mighty fortress, and to continue to remember the great things the Lord has done. One of the great things the Lord has done is provide salvation for every man, woman, boy, and girl. Jesus came to be that salvation. He said in John 14, 6, that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one gets to heaven except through Jesus. It is Jesus and Jesus alone that gets us to heaven. Why? Because we don't deserve heaven. Romans 3.23 instructs us that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. What that verse is saying is, is no matter how good you are, you're not good enough to earn your way into heaven. Because all of us have sinned and those sins have to be paid for. By doing a good deed, by performing a good deed, does not offset the bad that each and every one of us have done. Each and every one of us have fallen short of the glory of God. And the bad deeds we do earn us something. The Bible teaches us in Romans 6.23 that the wages of sin is death. The paycheck of sin is death. See, God grades on a different curve. There's no scale at the end of time where your good outweighs your bad. That's not the way it works because the only way you can pay for the bad things you do is to spend eternity in hell. That's what that word death means. The paycheck of my sin, of your sin, is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Where you and I couldn't, God did. He gave you the gift of eternal life. He says, I don't care how bad you've done what you've, I don't, he does care, don't get me wrong. He says that even though you do not deserve heaven, I'm going to give it to you because you're loved. And I'm going to pay your sin debt. I'm going to pay for the things that you have done wrong by sacrificing my one and only son. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him will never die, but instead will receive eternal life. See, God wants to prove to you today that he loves you. Romans 5.8 declares that God proves, demonstrates his love for us in this, that when we were sinners, he still died for us. Folks, that's love. It's honorable to die for someone, the Bible says, that deserves it. But Jesus died for you and for me when we didn't deserve it. To prove his love. So that no matter who you are, or what you've done, you can call on the name of the Lord and be saved. Romans 10, 13 says that everyone who, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Is there a time in your life you can go to and say, that is the day I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord. That is the day I called on him to save me. Now, those of us who have been following God for decades, we may, may not remember the exact day and time, but we know that we've called on His name. The Bible instructs us in Romans 10, verse 9, that it's a two-step process to call on the name of the Lord. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. That word confess means to agree. You agree with God that he is number one. That you are going to live for him. That you are going to do uncomfortable things because he is that important. That he is number one. And you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, the Bible says you'll be saved. Is there a time that you have done that? We're going to uh, stand and have our moment of invitation and our closing song. But before we do that, I just want to give you a couple moments to just do some business with Jesus. 
And if ever, whoever has that guitar would come forward and just give us some background music, I would be eternally grateful, not a have to. <laughs> please, please. I hate to uh, call you out on that, but it really, really helps. So thank you. She's done this before. It's not her first time. <laughs> and it probably won't be the last, ma'am. So thank you. <laughs> so as she plays, there's two things I want you to consider quietly. Are you where you need to be with Jesus? Have you called on his name to be saved? If you answer yes to that, are you doing everything you need to do for him? Is he truly your Lord? And if you are not sure about that, grab me, grab one of the elders here, and we'll be glad to explain that to you. Everybody, if you bow your head and close your eyes just for a couple moments of introspection, of reflection. Lord, as we're doing business with you here today, help us to rely on your joy to be our strength. For those that aren't sure where they would spend eternity, I pray that they wouldn't find sleep tonight until they get right with you. For those that have wandered away, Lord, I pray that they would come back to you, that today would be the day that the lost would become saved. Those that have slid away would become solid, that those that are suffering would find your peace, your solace. And those searching would find the true and one and only source. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you'll stand to your, I believe next is our, our song. So we'll sing in joy to the Lord. Thank you.